it was very important for me not to name the, the country uh, where this all took place. Um, it happened uh, in my, when my first book was published, stories that really did name Peru and were stories about, about Peru. That people, I would get emails from people say, you know, I've never been to Peru, but this sounds just like Pakistan. You know, I've never been to Peru, but you know, I'm from Nigeria, and this book could be written about Lagos. You know, Lima sounds just like Lagos. You know, um, and emails like that sort of made me think uh, that if Peru were an invented country, um, and I'd made up Lima for the purposes of my first book of fiction, it would still resonate with a lot of people um, because there were certain sort of uh, certain certain themes that are uh, ap applicable to all sort of developing cities uh, or you know, giant me mega cities um, in transition. Um, so when I started writing the novel, I, um, I sort of deliberately made the choice, let me play with this idea, create my own city, create my own country um, that might have a lot uh, to do with, uh, with Peru and sort of follow the basic sort of uh, historical trajectory of, of contemporary Peru but which borrows elements from Ethiopia, from the conflict in Bosnia, from uh, the conflict in Chechnya, from, um, you know, a lot of the place names are from neighborhoods in Accra, where I lived in 1997, 1998, um, and, uh, and make the place a place that is both uh, invented but recognizable. Um, I wanted to create some, uh, this, this feeling of, of, of discomfort in the reader. Um, where it's not reality, but it's something that just hovers just above what we generally call reality. Um, a city that, that, uh, that feels very real, uh, even if you can't find it on a map. Um, so I spent a lot of time nailing down certain details. I had a map of Lima that I drew over and created new districts and created new names and uh, you know, really went at the, the city with a, with, a, with a black marker and reinvented it. And, um, and in that way, had my geography straight. Um, of course, I've lost that map now, so my, my geography is less less correct than it used to be. But it's it's uh, it was just important for for me uh, for one more other reason actually that I should mention. Um, if I invented the city and I never named the country, then I could uh, I could manipulate the history um, as I saw fit, right? And that's important because I didn't I didn't want to write a history textbook about the conflict in Peru. Um, I wanted to, to write a novel. <laughs> a, a, a sense of history is, is important for a democratic society, and uh, but I, I don't know many societies that really have a, a good sense of history. Uh, the, the, the state that I describe in the novel, um, uh, collective amnesia is, is sort of a coping mechanism, and I think that that's, you know, you can see that at an individual level, you can see it as a, as a, as a, on a macro level. Um, you can see it in the controversy that, that, uh, that erupted in Peru for when they tried to create a truth commission. You can see it in the controversy around the idea of a museum of historical memory, which, you know, isn't happening. You know, it was proposed and shot down uh, because it's, there's no history that can be agreed upon. So then we can't have a museum of historical memory because there'll be a bunch of empty walls. Um, but I think you see it in the United States, too. You know, I think there's a great deal of, uh, of inconvenient, unpleasant historical facts that, uh, that are best ignored um, for the sake of, of creating sort of a coherent nat national discourse. Um, the problem is that the people who quite rightly point out these, you know, historical omissions um, get branded as radicals or as, uh, you know, uh, extremists or as, uh, you know, people outside the mainstream that we don't have to pay attention to, you know. It, it was interesting. I've been following with one eye, or keeping one eye on this, this issue in, in Tucson where they're banning um, uh, certain books. Um, because um, uh, because they teach sort of certain facts, like for example, that Arizona used to be part of Mexico, you know, um, and that's not something that was that's that's a fact, that's a historical fact. But uh, but it's it's become a controversial fact in a state 
that is divided between you know older Anglo's and younger Mexicans, you know younger Mexican Americans, um, and uh, and the 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 issue, the issue is very clear. The, when facts become controversial, you're not really able to have a dialogue. You know when you can't state state something that is part of the historical record, then you're in trouble. <laughs> um, you know, media plays a, a, an important role in any in any sort of national discourse and, and any any state that purports to be democratic. Um, uh, and I, I should say even more so in a state that purports to be democratic. In the, in the case of uh, of um, this kind of propagandizing media that I describe in, in the novel, I do see lots of parallels with. With our current, uh, with the sort of the real actual media here in the United States, and certainly in in, in Peru and in other countries, um, here I feel like uh, it's not so much that bad news is uh, is sort of whitewashed, but I feel like uh, the bad news or news is always it doesn't it very rarely does it come just as news, but it comes almost immediately with an interpretation. Um, I think more so on on television than, than in, in other outlets. Although I guess I don't listen to, to a lot of talk radio, um, um, which is which is, you know, perhaps that's the way it's always been. Perhaps it's impossible. You know, objectivity is probably not not a, an ideal or that that's reachable. Um, but uh, you know, I'm I'm speaking on Tuesday, January 24th tonight. Barack Obama will give his State of the Union address, and uh, people on one side or the other have already decided exactly what their reaction will be before he's given the speech. You know, and that's, that's, uh, that's not um, news. You know, it's not, the, the, the interpretations are not news, but the, the fact that those interpretations will be broadcast sort of immediately after as if they were sort of reasoned responses to something is, is, is inaccurate. That's, that's a false, um, it's, it's, a, it's a giant show, it's, it's not real, you know. Um, so if anything, I would say that, that might be a parallel to the, what I was to the novel. It's an interesting question. I have a lot of, of concerns uh, uh, about the current situation and the, the current state of our democracy. I think um, um, the, the extremes, uh, the, ex the extreme points of view get more weight than they deserve, um, um, and it's a it's a question of you know the, the the people who scream the loudest. Right now, it feels to me like the people who scream the loudest get get the most attention and and uh, um, beyond their numbers, you know. And I mean, sometimes literally screaming because uh, I I think back to that summer uh, that was that where everyone spent their summer screaming at their representatives. Um, a couple of years ago, maybe that was three years ago, um, summer of 2009, I believe it was. Um, and uh, it was really, to me, a very low point in American discourse. You know, it was the year that, uh, that someone interrupted uh, the State of the Union and shouted that the president was lying, you know. Um, that, to me, this is, that to me is very undemocratic. I, I, um, I, uh, uh, and, and, and possibly I disagree with, you know, with, with a lot of people to the left of me. I, I feel like all, all sort of points of view should be heard, even people you disagree with. And, and I don't believe in shouting anyone down. I believe in listening to them and then, and then debating, discussing, and you know, defeating with ideas if, if that's what it takes. Um, and uh, and so, so the, the tendency to shout, which, you know, the sort of metaphorical shouting and the and the literal shouting, I think, is, is a real danger to, to democracy. And the idea that the that people who disagree with you are somehow enemies of the state, I think, is, is, is an idea that's gained a lot of currency um, in the last few years. And uh, I mean, since I was a kid, you know, uh, you know, since, since it's just gotten worse. Um, I think uh, the, the, you can see it most clearly in in uh, in the the sort of ideological development of the Republican Party that 
that uh, you know, um, Ronald Reagan would be a sort of centrist Democrat now. I mean, I, I know that he's he's sort of in the pantheon of American Republican heroes, but really, quite honestly, if you look at his policies, he would be a a, a, a centrist Democrat, and um, and that's that's kind of frightening. I mean, I, th I think I find that sort of o only. Uh, um, sort of exposes how how much the the idea of sort of civilized conversation has degenerated. Um, in terms of things that make me hopeful, um, I'm afraid there's not a ton of things that make me hopeful right now. Um, I mentioned earlier the the idea of culture, and I and I think that the you know the reason I am not an activist and the reason I am not a uh, you know, don't spend all my day thinking about politics is because I do find more hope in the cultural realm. And I see things happening, whether they're, you know, whether, whether it's a sort of self-generated, you know, uh, you know some, something exciting coming out of a neighborhood or a particular subculture, uh, a new form of artistic expression, whether it's dance or music or slang or, um, you know, um, New ways of dealing with, uh, you know, the economic crisis. Very creative ways that people are using. Um, I feel like those are exciting uh, and, and compelling places to to find hope. You know, sort of small, individual, community-driven responses to to larger problems. I feel like th those are sort of the basic building blocks of democracy. Um, so they might not affect, you know, the electoral college or sort of the the, the giant things when we think about when we think about the political structure of a country. That's, that tends to be what we think of when we think of democracy. But I think there's other smaller, more sort of uh, street level ways of thinking of, of the democratic process. Those are the ones that I find inspiring. Certainly, I'm an American writer, and certainly the American context affects what I write. In the case of Lost City Radio, um, while the, a lot of the history on the surface would appear to be sort of Peruvian history or contemporary Peruvian history or based on that history, um, I think of it as a novel that's very much about the war on terror and the, the, you know, the, the post-9-11 US. You know, um, I grew up hearing the words terrorism and and thinking and associating them with the city where I was born and the country where I was born, and never with the United States. And then you know after two thousand one, obviously that shifted, um, and we came in this country to learn all this new vocabulary and all these new ways of being afraid um, that were recognizable to me from conversations I had as, as, a, as a kid. So um, when, uh, when I was working on this novel, I was certainly thinking about the United States and certainly thinking about um, our political context here and our political development here and, and sort of the, uh, it was impossible not to, to notice the parallels. Um, specifically, I think uh, the, ways, the ways fear was used, the way People's uh, emotions were manipulated. I think those were all sort of recognizable tropes to me. 